My name is Todd Pierce. I'm a retired U.S. Army Judge Advocate Officer. I created this video to share with my family and others as a short memoir of one part of my experience as an Army JAG Officer. I represented Guantanamo prisoners before the military commissions as Defense Counsel. In doing that, I became acquainted with a number of individuals who played important roles in our nation's history. Two of them you will hear in this video, Noam Chomsky and William Polk both speaking on the subject of nuclear arms and of how close we came to nuclear war and nuclear accidents during the Cold War, and of how we returned to that danger over the last decade to the present day. The speakers would agree with me that the potential today of a nuclear catastrophe is as great or greater than it was during the Cold War. Most young people today are unaware of this history and how it is being replayed today with them paying the greatest part of the cost including the potential cost of nuclear annihilation. So I hope viewers will pay attention and act to educate themselves further and demand an end to nuclear weapons and the spending of vast amounts of money by the U.S. on them. Professor Chomsky, could you tell me a little bit about your experience and knowledge of uh, back when you were younger in regard to nuclear weapons and, and how you see the world today with nuclear weapons as a threat again? Well, my first memory of nuclear weapons is August 6th, 1945. I was a counselor at a summer camp and uh, in the morning there was an announcement uh, over the loudspeaker uh, saying that uh, the U.S. had just uh, dropped an atom bomb on Hiroshima, uh, killed huge numbers of people, destroyed the city. Uh, at that point, two awful uh, experiences took place. One was just hearing what had happened and understanding very well that uh, although this bomb would not destroy the world, uh, in the natural course of technology, we would pretty soon be at a point where uh, it would, the destruction would be unlimited. And the second reaction was that uh, nobody cared. Everybody just listened and went on with their normal activities, baseball game, uh, swimming, uh, whatever it was. I was so, uh, I was 16 years old as a kid, but I was so upset about it, I just took off on my own. and went off into the woods and sat there for a couple hours thinking about what all this means. Uh, both the event and what it implied and the lack of interest, which was quite striking. And that's continued to the present. Uh, I mean, we've been through one horrible experience after another. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, nuclear weapons, it's virtually miraculous that we've escaped. I don't have to give you the details, but uh, there's been time after time, uh, actually hundreds of cases, where uh, uh, we came ominously close to uh, using nuclear weapons, which by the 1980s it was understood that this would be essentially terminal. Even a first strike would destroy the attacker. But uh, And uh, uh, again, uh, nobody cares. It's a background is issue which there's very little discussion of. Dr. Polk, would you care to discuss your experience with the Cuban Missile Crisis when you were with the Kennedy administration? Yes, sir. Um, in the first day of the crisis, uh, or the first day that we all were fully briefed on the, on the Monday of the crisis week, I was taken to um, the office of the Secretary of State and told that I was to be a member of the three-man uh, crisis management committee that uh, were fully briefed on everything that was happening during the week. And the three of us, uh, Bob Comer in the White House and uh, Bill Bundy in the Defense Department, Bob was uh, Deputy Chief of the National Security Council and Bill Bundy was the 
Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, and I were the three designated members of this committee. And our task was to oversee everything that happened to be sure that nothing, as it were, fell off the table. Uh, everybody's eyes were focused on Cuba, of course, and on uh, the Soviet Union. And our task was to make sure that we didn't overlook anything. Kennedy was extremely concerned as he read uh, various things on the First World War uh, to see how events took hold of the people who were involved and controlled the action rather than the people controlling the action. And uh, so what we were trying to do was to make sure that uh, we all were fully briefed all the time and our task was to alert the Secretary of State or the President uh, or the head of the National Security Council or the Secretary of Defense, or all of them indeed, um, if we found something that was amiss in the actions that we were taking uh, or something that we were doing that we shouldn't have been doing. And uh, so we were uh, privileged to be three of the approximately 25 or so civilians in the American government who really knew what was happening during the missile crisis. And it was a really quite remarkable experience and, of course, terrifying in many ways because uh, we could see the events leading up to a possible nuclear war. And we were all fully briefed on what a nuclear war meant. Uh, we were all fully cleared for everything the government knew about the Soviet Union or everything we knew about nuclear weapons. So we knew that if we actually did get into a war, we would really be de destroying the world. Right now, uh, uh, some of the internal documents are really shocking. Uh, one of the most shocking that I've ever read, I have talked about it occasionally, but never seem to have convinced anyone, uh, was uh, the standard scholarly history of nuclear weapons by McGeorge Bundy, former you know, National Security Advisor, who had uh, access to uh, all high-level materials for this quasi-official history. And he says some very interesting things. For example, if you go back to 1950, uh, at that point the U.S. was still basically invulnerable. Uh, the uh, Russians had an atomic bomb, but no delivery means really. The ICBMs did not yet exist. Uh, they were on the horizon. They would exist, but they had not been developed. Uh, and the U.S. had overwhelming advantages, of course, in uh, bomber capacity and so on. So a natural proposal at that point would have been in the, in the United States, in the government, to see if we can possibly negotiate a treaty with the Russians which will prevent the development of the one weapon that uh, could not only attack us but destroy us. Bundy goes into this. He mentions, uh, more or less in passing, without any particular interest, that he was, uh, on, he talks about the plans to develop ICBMs. And he mentions that uh, he was not able to find uh, any proposal, even a staff paper, uh, discussing the possibility of preventing the development of these weapons. And then he goes on to say he thinks it's a very good thing to have developed them, no, no comment. It's pretty astonishing, especially when you look at the background. Uh, uh, shortly after that, in 1952, uh, Stalin made a a pretty remarkable proposal. He offered to uh, uh, allow Germany to be unified, uh, to have uh, elections, which of course the communists would lose, uh, but with one condition, that it be neutralized. Now if you look at the history, Germany alone had practically destroyed Russia twice in that century. This is hardly a uh, unreasonable proposal. Uh, it was almost entirely ignored. I mean, I, at that time I was following it. It was public. I could follow it. There was one uh, analyst, respected analyst, James Warburg, who uh, argued that he should pay some attention to it, but he was just dismissed. He wrote a, quite a good book called uh, Germany, Key to Peace.
1953. Uh, he was dismissed. Uh, anybody who mentioned it was just ridiculed. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, announcement of Stalin, the public announcement here of Stalin's proposal was in fact delayed about a month, I think, uh, during which time uh, the U.S. passed, the Congress passed a huge increase in the military budget, and uh, that's all, it was gone. Uh, the Russian archives have been released, and American scholars now looking at this uh, recognize that it could have been a serious offer. You read people like uh, Adam Ulam, uh, very anti-communist uh, Russian scholar, says, well, we really don't know whether uh, Stalin's offer of peace was serious. And the efforts to evade it, he said, are kind of embarrassing. Uh, Melvin Leffler, who's maybe the leading scholar of the Cold War, says, uh, now that we have the Russian archives, we see that even uh, Lavrenti Beria, you know, this utter monster, uh, was talking seriously internally about uh, moving towards peace, uh, dismantling offensive weapons and so on. Uh, that was the early 50s. Nobody, it's not just the campers at the camp where I was who didn't care, it's the high official, highest officials. They had no interest, even a staff paper, in averting uh, the major threat to the United States, a threat of destruction. Just no interest. Let's plunge ahead. Uh, if you uh, proceed a little further, it continues. So uh, after, uh, it, after Stalin's death, uh, a, little, a couple of years later, Khrushchev took over. Khrushchev understood very well that Russia could not uh, compete with the United States. It, it was far less developed economically. Uh, uh, before 1917, it had been a backward peasant country, uh, declining relative to the West since the 15th century. It was devastated by the First World War, again by the Second World War. It had become an industrial power, but nowhere near the capacity of the US. He wanted Russia to develop economically and knew this could not be done in the context of an arms race. So he made an offer to cut back a mutual uh, cutback of offensive military weapons. Well, the, it was late in the Eisenhower administration. They apparently disregarded it. Uh, Kennedy came in. Uh, they paid attention to it. They listened to it, decided to reject it, even though Khrushchev had, in fact, unilaterally uh, cut back on offensive weapons. Instead, what they did was uh, proceed to the biggest arms buildup in history. In other words, here's a chance for peace, but what do we care? Let's build, let, we're already way ahead of them, let's go farther ahead. Now that's one of the factors that led to the missile crisis. Uh, scholarship is pretty well agreed by now that there were two factors in the missile crisis. One was Khrushchev's effort to try to get some slight balance against the overwhelming U.S. military advantage. Uh, the other was uh, the terrorist campaign against Cuba. Uh, the, the Russians may not, and the Cubans might not have known all the details, but they knew what was going on. It was a serious campaign. And in fact, in uh, August 1962, whether the Russians knew it or not, uh, Kennedy had signed an official uh, national security memorandum calling for the terrorist uh, operation, Operation Mongoose, to accelerate its efforts uh, to aim for an uprising in October 1962, which would lead to American intervention. October 1962, sound familiar? That's when the missiles went in. Uh, you might ask Dan, who was on the inside at the time, but I if I'm reporting his judgment correctly, I think his opinion is that, uh, but check with him, that uh, the uh, threat to Cuba was probably more significant than the effort to balance the overwhelming U.S. advantage. But anyway, the two of them were there. All right, here we have a s steps taken that there were clearly opportunities to determine whether there was a chance for peace, and it looks pretty serious, just as it did in the early 50s. 
not just as it did when, before the uh, uh, development of ICBMs. Not only ignore, but move in the other direction consistently. Let's have a bigger military buildup. And the story continues right through that. It's uh, an amazing picture. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament perhaps? Any, any final sage advice for world's leaders? My belief is that the only rational thing that we can move toward is zero nuclear weapons. But on the nuclear side, it seems to me that the nuclear danger is so appalling for everyone that we should really do everything we can to stop it. I might just say, if you have a mo moment more, what we're really talking about. Is Anything you a, want to say, Bill, I want to hear. What, whatever, what we're really talking about, if we have a nuclear war, is something that I fear that most people today have really forgotten about. Uh, we all were horrified by Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but that was, after all, years and years and years ago, and uh, there hasn't been a nuclear war real scare that people know about uh, generally uh, anywhere today. So uh, I think it's fair to say that the younger generation of people today are not really aware as, as I have had the unfortunate experience to be aware of in my life. What, what would happen if there were a nuclear weapon is, has been very carefully studied by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences by a large number of nuclear scientists, by the uh, American scientist Carl Sagan, who did a report on this uh, many, many years ago, but it's long since forgotten about. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things that would happen if there were a nuclear war. First of all, um, practically everyone in the Northern Hemisphere would be dead, uh, either initially by firestorms, which would burn them to death, as, as cities were incinerated, or by the results of fallout of nuclear waste and, and uh, uh, so forth that would uh, sicken them and cause their deaths. We've seen this in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the people who weren't killed initially uh, died early. Uh, there, there are large numbers of them, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of them died over the years with cancer that was caused by nuclear weapons and various other diseases that were caused by them. Uh, one thing that stuck in my mind as I read these reports was the ground would be frozen everywhere to the depth of about three feet so that bodies couldn't even be buried. Um, no water could be obtained because everything would be uh, frozen and people would be sick and weak, of course, from the effects, those that were still alive, and um, they would be starving to death. And um, you think, just um, if, if you can imagine thinking of the earth underneath us as far as the eye can see and much further, frozen to the depth of about three feet, uh, nothing could live, no plants could live, no animals could could live, people couldn't get anything to eat or to drink or, or anything else. Uh, just that one thing, and uh, the firestorm, the, uh, the results of destroying a whole civilization. Chairman Mao in China thought that China would survive, uh, or enough Chinese would survive. Uh, one of the so-called big bomb men in America thought that only 60 million of us would be killed only 60 million. And that was years ago, so the number would certainly be higher today. And the pr nuclear weapons that were being used then were perhaps not as powerful as the ones being used today. But every single city that we can think of would be destroyed in the world. All our libraries, all our traditions, all of our history, all of our children, uh, all of our relatives, um, uh, the, the the thought is just so mind-boggling that I think people just don't want to think about it. I've just turned it off. And it's terribly important, it seems to me, for us to, to carry that message back into people's consciousness today, because it hasn't gone away. It's only we who've forgotten about it. If there's anything else you'd like to add, Bill, please no. do now. But otherwise, thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. I hope this video was informative and inspires viewers to educate themselves further on these issues and share what they learn with their families and fellow citizens, as I am doing here. If enough of us become concerned, maybe we can stop the new arms race before we destroy ourselves, which begins with seeing our own country far in the lead in this so-called race.